So we want to pick up on Floquet theory and consider this classic problem that comes out of physics, and this is related to the pendulum. So I'm calling this, this lecture the pendulum and Floquet theory. So what we want to understand is uh, the stability of the pendulum. The pendulum has periodic orbits, right? We can set the thing swinging, and obviously it's, it's very easy for us to understand that the pendulum in the downward position can be stable, but there's another interesting physics phenomenon I want to highlight today, which is what we want to do is take the pendulum, and here's the picture of the pendulum, we're going to drive this thing. In particular, the way we're going to drive it is we're going to take the support here and oscillate it back and forth. Let's say with some amplitude epsilon and cosine omega t, so omega is the, going to be the driving frequency, epsilon is going to be the, uh, oscill uh, the amplitude of those uh, oscillations. And so we're going to just take this pendulum on a support and then oscillate it. And then the question we're going to ask is going to be related to what happens. In particular, one of the things that uh, we're going to address is, can you, with such a perturbation to the system, stabilize the pendulum in the upright position? In other words, is the inverted pendulum stable by driving it with this kind of forcing? Now, generically, what we'd really like to do is drive it like this, just with some sinusoidal oscillations, right? Smooth, continuous. And what we're going to do analytically is going to approximate this smooth forcing by some piecewise forcing, because then we can actually work out all the algebra explicitly. So in other words, the support's going to be up, down, up, down, instantaneously, just like in this picture here. OK, this is a little fake, but it's going to allow us to do the computation and calculation about the stability of the pendulum in the upright inverted position. Now, the governing equations in this point are given by here. This is fully nonlinear. It's a second derivative, f equals ma, right? So it's second derivative. And here, the pendulum has sine x. Remember, that's the nonlinear pendulum has its x double prime plus sine x or minus sine x. Here, uh, I'm going to say that there's a, usually a constant in front of it, delta. But now, I'm adding to that epsilon cosine omega t, which represents the forcing from this amplitude fluctuation here. There's two parameters here. There's the delta and the epsilon. So epsilon, remember, again, is uh, actually three parameters. But delta and epsilon are the magnitudes, sort of this is the strength of your standard pendulum in terms of uh, mg. Uh, uh, Right? And then the, over here, this epsilon is the amplitude of the forcing, and omega is the driving frequencies. And so what we're going to do is explore the pendulum as a function of these three parameters and start to try to understand what happens to the physics of this pendulum under this kind of driving forcing that we have here. OK, so let's look at this. Um, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the pendulum near the inverted and the downward position. When you're downwards, you're near x equals 0. So sine x you know, can be approximated by x minus x cubed over 3 factorial, so forth. Normally, what we do is we do small amplitude. Uh, in the small amplitude limit, we place sine x by x. So that's gonna allow, that would allow us to address the stability of the pendulum in the down position. Now, we are, that's kind of a boring case. We already know what happens there, right? The, the downwards pendulum is stable in that position. The inverted pendulum is when x is equal to pi. So now you're pi up. You're facing straight upwards. So this sine of x plus pi, that's this here. You just use your trig identity to show that's like negative sine x, which when you do the Taylor series expansion of this for small amplitude fluctuations near the top is minus x plus x cubed. Notice the sign change. That's the big difference. When you're in the upright position, you get this minus x. Now, in the linear linear, remember that this is x double prime is equal to minus x here, which is sines and cosine solutions. This would be x double prime equals x, which is exponential solutions. It's like a saddle. You have one growing, one decaying mode. So you walk away from the top. You say it's unstable. But now we've introduced a perturbation to the system, which is this modulation of where the bracket holds this thing into place. This equation here is called Mathieu's equation, then. And depending upon when you're, if you're in the upward or inverted position, this is a plus or minus sign there. And so we're going to study Mathieu's equation. And we're going to study stability 
of periodic solutions dry, driven by this epsilon cosine omega t term. And we're going to ask, does anything really change in the physics? I'm in upright position. You imagine you're always going to get pulled over. And you're in down position. You're always going to stay there because there's nothing to make you go away from that. Gravity's holding you in place. OK. So this is the question we want to address. This is a mathematical construct. We're just going to ask the question, can you invert, can you stabilize this pendulum in the inverted position? OK, fair question. And of course, at least at first, maybe you haven't thought about it. Maybe you say, like, I don't know, probably not, right? Gravity would just pull this thing down. You know, whenever you put it up, it might stay there for a bit, but it's going to fall over. But now the question is, what's happening with this term here, this driving term that I have that's oscillating that bracket? So what I'm going to do is break this up into two components. Remember, I'm going to assume that this thing here is going to be piecewise. So it's going to be plus and then minus and then plus and then minus. I'm going to approximate that sign by two constant pieces. Okay? So here it is. Piecewise oscillations are like this. Here's the governing equations from 0 to half the period, t over 2. And here's the governing equations from t over 2 to t. The di big difference here is the sign. So this, the, it's plus epsilon, minus epsilon. That's the only difference between the two. Okay? So that's going to give us in the up or down position. And remember, this is an approximation. If I come back to here, it's saying I'm going to approximate this here, this forcing sign by piecewise constant forcing here. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I can work out my Floquet discriminant exactly analytically in this case if I have this piecewise constant form where I can't do it in the case where it's actually sinusoidal and continuous. OK, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these are my governing equations. And it shifts from time 0 to t over 2, it's this. t over 2 to t, it's this. And then I keep going back. And then it's here and then here. Just keep going back every half period. So remember, for the Floquet discriminant, what I have to compute, this is from the last lecture, is this quantity here, gamma, this Floquet discriminant, is equal to the first fundamental solution evaluated at t. The second fundamental solution, its derivative valued at t. And remember, x1 satisfies the initial condition that it is one, its value is 1 and its derivative is 0 at time 0. And x2 satisfies that the solution is 0 and its derivative is 1 at time t equals 0. So I've got to find these solutions with these two different initial conditions. And once I find x1 and x2, I could construct this Floquet discriminant for this problem. OK? So let's go compute these things. So first of all, what are the solutions? Well, your fundamental solutions between 0 to t over 2 is given by here. This is just, here's your solution. They're exponentials. Remember, we're near that saddle. So one's a growing exponential. One looks like a decaying exponential. OK? And that's also the case when you're here in the regime t over 2 to t. Remember, you're near the saddle, so you say, I got these two solutions that have saddle type structure. Inside of this square root, there's a plus epsilon in the first part of it and a minus epsilon in the second part of it. And then, so those are the two solutions. And for me to construct a solution from time 0 all the way to capital T, the initial condition of this, I run it from time 0 to time t over 2. And that's the initial condition now for the second part, which runs from t over 2 to capital T. OK? So you can do a lot of algebra here. So let's just call this the algebra hell slide. I've done it all for you. You can work this all out. I'm not going to go through it in detail. But this is just taking those two solutions. And now what you're going to do with these two solutions, you're going to say my fundamental solution x1 satisfies that at time t equals 0, the solution is 1, its derivative is 0. I input those initial conditions in, work this thing all the way through. Those are the two constraints I have that need to be satisfied. Okay? My second fundamental solution, x2, it initially its solution is 0, the derivative is 1. And so I can put those in, solve, and here is what I get. x1 is this solution right here, written all out. Notice that I have hyperbolic cosines here and here, 
hyperbolic sines here and there. Same here, now a mixing of hyperbolic sines and cosines, hyperbolic sines and cosines. So I have x1, I have x2. And what I need to do then is take x1, evaluate it at capital T. I need to take the derivative of x2 and evaluate it at capital T. So even more algebra comes up, which is I have to do those calculations, evaluate them. Once I have them, I add them together to form my Floquet discriminant. And there is the Floquet discriminant. Okay? So this is actually a, a quite an instructive problem, right? It's, a, it's, it's the pendulum. It's about as simple a problem as you can come up with that still, seems, that still has like this physical, nice physical interpretation. And it's a lot of work to get this, but there you are. This is your Floquet discriminant as a function of this delta and as a function of this epsilon. And we have it all worked out here with the period variable t directly in there. So a couple things to notice. These are complex, uh, complicated expressions, but I can just plot them on you know, MATLAB or any other kind of uh, software tool you want. But I do want to highlight this first. If you take omega to be big, in fact, uh, this is one of the calculations you can show is for large frequencies, what's going to happen with this thing here, uh, it's going to be stable because, in fact, this Floquet discriminant is going to go, if you take it into this asymptotic limit, you can actually show that this thing collapses to 2 cosine square root of epsilon minus delta pi over omega. Okay? And remember that the frequency is related to this capital T here. The frequency of the forcing omega, that's what I'm actually looking at here, is directly related to the period t. It determines the period t. So for very high frequencies, in other words, a very short period, I can actually find that gamma goes to this value here. Cosine is bounded between 1 and minus 1. So this thing here is going to a value of 2. And stability was determined if the Floquet discriminant was 2 or less. So it's 2 or less. So for high frequency oscillations of that thing, when I'm forcing it at very high frequencies, what it tells you is the Floquet discriminant satisfies, in fact, the stability properties that we talked about in the last lecture, which is the Floquet discriminant is less than 2. That's interesting, right? So it tells you, at least for high frequency oscillations, I should be able to stabilize that pendulum in the right position. In fact, I can actually compute that Floquet discriminant, right? I can just plot it. And these are for different regimes. There's a lot of plots here, but the force panels up here are for delta being bigger than epsilon. Remember that delta is just the standard pendulum parameter, like x double dot equals delta x. So that's the delta. And epsilon is the amplitude of the forcing. So if delta is bigger than epsilon, here are your Floquet discriminants as a function of forcing frequency omega. And if delta is less than epsilon, again, Floquet discriminant as a function of forcing frequency omega. And for each of these, I want to point some things out. So when you're in the downward pendulum, the, two, the dotted lines on all these is where the Floquet discriminant is 2 or minus 2. And so everything is stable if I'm in this between the dotted lines. So the downward pendulum, notice, in either case, whether it's a nonlinear pendulum or a linear pendulum. And by the way, the nonlinear pendulum here, I actually just computed this thing for the full nonlinear pendulum. What I worked out in theory was here for the linear pendulum. But this computation of the Floquet discriminant it can just simply be a numerical simulation. right? You can just say, I want to run through a period with the initial, find one fundamental solution with, with the initial conditions 1, 0. And the other solution with 0, 1 is the initial conditions. Run them, construct a Floquet discriminant, and that's what you get here. So the downward pendulum is always stable in this case. It's also, uh, sorry, and here in an inverted pendulum, it's not stable until you get to a sufficiently high frequency where this thing now drops to the value of 2. And I can do the same calculation here for, the, for instance, the inverted pendulum. Again, now it has this structure here where it drops down to 2 and it's stable. Here, it's stable over here. And up here, even in the downward pendulum here, for this case here, epsilon can be pretty big. And it can actually destabilize your pendulum until you force it at a high enough frequency. Notice the amplitude fluctuations 
are much bigger than the, natu the, than the, than the frequency than, than the actual pendulum dynamics itself for gravity. It's not a small perturbation. It's a very large, it's a larger one. So then you do destabilize the pendulum until you get to a critical value in right here of frequency forcing here and here. So this gives you a summary of this. And what it's telling you is something really interesting. You can invert that pendulum just by oscillating it on its support at a sufficiently high frequency. Every single one of these plots show you that if you go past a critical value of that frequency of forcing, you can stabilize the pendulum. So now, here comes the question. Do you believe that? Is this just this mathematical result where we've neglected some physics? This certainly can't be true that you could stabilize the pendulum in the upright position just by oscillating it. So this is where you can go to YouTube and actually get some videos. So what we're going to do now is like almost an inception scene. I'm going to be on, I'm on YouTube, and then we're going to watch YouTube within YouTube. Like, and if I did one more layer, I'd be like three layers down in the YouTube, uh, into, in the YouTube stream. But here we're just stopping at two layers just to show that it can be done. And here we go. This is a YouTube and video, and this is a guy named uh, Inverted Pendulum Starring Alan. All right, here he goes. What he's got is a jigsaw there with this pendulum. He's attached it to the arm. He's just attached this arm to a jigsaw. And you can see it's just a pendulum, right? And you can see how it's just, you know, it exact, acts exactly like the pendulum like you expect it to do. Now what he's going to do is he turns on this jigsaw, which basically is oscillating the bracket here very rapidly, and he just stabilized the pendulum in the upright position. This is not magic. This is all just physics. Kind of awesome, right? So you can find lots of videos like this on YouTube, or maybe not lots, but you can certainly find some, like for instance, Alan here, who shows you and does the actual experiment showing you that, in fact, you can stabilize the pendulum in the upright position with a bracket that oscillates here. And here the epsilon is smaller than delta, so it's a very small oscillation, but sufficiently high frequency. And everything tells you that if you make a sufficiently high frequency, you will stabilize it. And this video shows you exactly that. And there you go. We were two YouTube levels in, and now we're back out to just one YouTube level. And now uh, this is the last lecture that concludes this course on advanced differential equations. Uh, but I, 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 like, I like some of the results here that you've seen. Hopefully you've enjoyed them as well. And this is all about these ideas of stability. And here we've now addressed it directly for periodic systems using flow K theory, and even close it off with a nice little experiment. Not by me, but by others. Um, thank you very much.